Hello, and welcome to today's daily study. We're going to continue here from yesterday. Yesterday, Christ had just healed a woman who had been bent over for 18 years, and they were upset with him because he healed on the Sabbath. And he told them, you know, if you unleash your animals to go and water them, then how much more uh, is it important to unleash the the sons and daughters of Abraham, like the children of God is what he means, uh, the sons and daughters of Abraham, from their bonds to, to sin and to Satan on the Sabbath day. Like, why are you complaining about this? And we see that they understood that they were in the wrong because they, they turned away ashamed. Anyway, and from there we continue. Then said he, unto, uh, unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it? In other words, how can I explain to you in a way you'll understand the kingdom of heaven, and the basically the celestial kingdom, the plan of our heavenly Father? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden. And we know from Joseph Smith's translation that it was actually more purposeful, like he actually sowed it in his garden. And it grew and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. And so we see as well this, this symbolism of the grain of mustard seed elsewhere inside the scriptures. This was a common expression among the Judaic leaders of the day. This was something that they used to teach many principles. And here we see Christ using it to its fullest extent. He's teaching, he is the perfect teacher. Everything that he says and how he uses it is meant to have this multifaceted understanding. And here we see that Christ is, is taking this example of something that was very common in the day using a grain of mustard seed because of how common it was and how useful it was. So you take a, it's a very small seed, one that fits just in the very little bit of your hand, and you plant it, and it actually grows into a fairly large tree, one that has many branches that is of great use to many people, and, and that's where you get herbs and, and whatnot from the mustard plant. Anyway, and he said, uh, and he said, whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? So he's like, and how else can I explain this better? So here the grain of mustard seed is like, okay, it starts out as a small thing in your life until it grows and is completely filling in your life and very useful to you. And that's, that's the plan of Heavenly Father. So what else am I going to compare that to? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. So it doesn't mean that she like tucked it underneath three measures of meal. It means that she put it in and she folded it into the dough that she was using to make bread um, till the whole was leavened. In other words, until it had all risen. And he went through the cities and villages, teachings and, and teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And he said, and they said unto him, Lord. Are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. So, in this way, we see that uh, this woman here, or first off, the, the story of the leaven is, of course, comparing to the kingdom of God in the fact that it takes just a little bit of this leavening agent, this thing that makes bread rise, in order to make the bread rise whole, useful, and delicious. And it's the same with the kingdom of heaven. It's the same with the plan of our Heavenly Father, that it just takes a little bit of understanding before our lives become infinitely better because of it. All right. Um, and then his disciples were talking to him and said, how many people are going to be saved? Because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people compared to how many wicked people there are. And then here he's telling them to strive and enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. In other words, a lot of people aren't going to know where to look. So you who know where to look, work hard on getting in there so that other people can see you and know how to get there. Uh, when once the master of the house is risen up 
and hath shut uh, to the door, in other words, has shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence you are. In other words, I don't know who you belong to, because if you belong to me, you would be within my house. Um, and this goes along with a kind of a, another harmony story of not all who say unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And here you see him saying, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. So these people who outwardly appear righteous, maybe even are religious leaders in themselves, they're calling to Christ. And then Christ is like, I don't know where you come from because you're definitely, you don't belong to me. Um, and of course, Christ knows all things. This is more uh, symbolic than anything. Then shall you say, we've eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. And this is actually kind of damning to them. Like, this prevents them from seeing their problem. They think that being in proximity to Christ was enough. They say, well, we've eaten with you, and you taught in our streets. You've obviously seen us. And yet... They didn't belong to Christ. They weren't part of his household. They weren't part of this uh, this Lord's household. It says, uh, the master of the house has risen up. So they're not part of his household. And they say, uh, here it's indicative of the fact that they had seen Christ. They had had the opportunity to converse and to be part of his household. It says, we ate and drank in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets. So they were in proximity, and yet they refused to follow him. And we see what happens to people like that, who think that just being close to Christ is enough to save them, is enough to protect them. And he says, But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. In other words, you saw me, and you didn't follow me. So I don't know who you follow, but I know it's not me. Get away from me because you're not here to benefit me. You're not here to help me. And how do we help our Heavenly Father? By helping our brothers and sisters, by helping his children. So a lot of times we can sit there and we can see stuff like this and we can think, oh, well, you know, uh, Jesus is, is uh, somewhat selfish. You know, he wants everybody to uh, follow him and to do righteous things. And, and, and the, just because he wants that, that glory and that control. No, what is the glory of God? Jesus Christ answers that. The, the glory is to know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And the law and the prophets, all of them, are to know our Heavenly Father, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and with all thy, thy soul. And the second is just as important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So we see here a teaching of people who claim to be part of Christ's home that don't work with Christ, that never followed him, that the only thing they have is the proximity to Christ. And, and, and Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ talked about this in Isaiah as well, like Christ quoted from Isaiah saying, they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And so, uh, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. In other words, all these people who you think are so important and are so great are going to be separated from you because they chose to be righteous. Abraham is only famous, is only uh, big inside the scriptures and in gospel history because he was righteous. That was it. He decided to follow our Heavenly Father instead of following his own desires. And that's why we know about Abraham. Isaac, we know about Isaac 
because he decided to follow Heavenly Father, not for any other reason. We don't know what Isaac's trade was. We don't know how popular he was in the area roundabout. We just know that we know him because he's in the scriptures and because this whole uh, country was descended from him. And that country was descended from him because he was righteous. And so they're saying here that you see these people as important and you yourselves are not going to be among them because you're not doing the things that they did. You're not behaving righteously. And again, this goes back to the fact that Christ is talking about the relationship between the righteous, the wicked, and our life here on earth. And he's saying that those on this earth who sit there and are proclaiming my word, proclaiming to know me, are going to be under great condemnation because they they have nothing to do with me. Um, and they shall come from east and from west and from north and from south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. In other words, everyone is invited into the household of God and everyone that is righteous is going to be there, but not you who are being unrighteous. Uh, and behold, there are last which shall be first. In other words, the people that the Jews think are really base and banal and, and not worthy are going to be in the kingdom of heaven before even them. Uh, and the first which shall be last. So they who think themselves to be most important are going to be based and they're, they're going to be humbled. The same day there came a Pharisee saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And again, their attempt here was not in some uh, attempt to uh, benefit Christ. They wanted Christ gone from their city. They didn't want him teaching the people in ways that they didn't like, because he was teaching them to think for themselves. Through parables, they had to think for themselves. The answers weren't given to them. They had to work spiritually before they could receive those answers. The Pharisees wanted to think for them, wanted to be their thoughts, and that way gain power over the people. So here they're saying, Herod will kill thee, just in an attempt to get him to leave. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, and uh, calling Herod a fox, was somewhat insulting, but more indicative of the attributes of Herod. Herod was sneaky and cunning and, and calculating in his attempts to gain power. And so here it was insulting, but it was more indicative of the nature of Herod, calling him a fox, go ye and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. He spake that about his resurrection being uh, killed and then uh, and then resurrected on the third day, being there made perfect after his work was done. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jews, out of Jerusalem. And here he means outside of Jerusalem. In other words, I cannot be killed outside of Jerusalem. So I'm going to do my work today and tomorrow and the following day for as long as it takes for this prophecy to be fulfilled. Because a prophet isn't going, I'm not going to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where they're going to take me and kill me. And then this caused him to be utterly saddened at the idea that it was Jerusalem that was going to, to kill them, despite all that he'd done for them. And that prompted this particular response. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophet and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, shall say, Blessed is he that come in the name of the Lord. And we see that time coming. We see that the Lord's second coming is not far at hand. And whereas the ancient Jerusalem and uh, Jews had utterly denied Christ, now they claim he was one of their most important teachers. And we see the, that attitude changing. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope very much to see you tomorrow.